as we both know, uh, one of one of the more tougher challenges in in horror is not to make a good horror sequel, but to make a good horror anthology. And you somehow mm-hmm. pulled it off, uh, not only in the first movie, but with uh, Rad Chad's Revenge. I mean, this movie mm-hmm. is just as fun as the first one. How did the concept really come about for putting this one together? Oh God. Well, thank you so much. First off. And also thank you for everything that you've done for all of our projects and everything. You just been such a huge support and I, and I love it. Um, this was never supposed to happen. <laughs> you know, like this was just a movie we made with our friends and like threw some blood around and we're like, nobody's going to like these stupid jokes. And then all of a sudden, you know, people are doing fan art and there's people with tattoos and they're dressing up for Halloween. I'm like, uh, what did we just do? And so we had to kind of get in there. And then I was like, well, shit, we've killed people that I love. You know, what do I do now? But but then I'm like, wait a second. We're talking about horror tropes. There are no bigger horror tropes than the retconning of horror sequels, right? And who does that better than Saw? Like, and I was I was watching the Saw franchise again in, in preparation for Spiral because I wanted to see that that summer. And I remember I was like, I cannot figure out the logic of this. Like, like you're getting to saw six, seven, they just like cut to like a flashback and there were two people talking. And then like, no, there were four people talking. And then the next one, there were like six. I'm like, they just keep throwing people in the background. All these crazy things keep happening. And then Carrie Elway shows up and all this. And I'm like, and I'm, and I have no idea what saw's motivation is anymore. Like jigsaw's motivation. Like it's totally not making any sense to me. And he's still there in the movies, even though he's died like a couple of times, you know, whatever. And so it's all so wild. And I was like, well, this is, this becomes a framework that's a lot of fun. Plus, I had a lot of frustration with like some, you know, horror fandom or just fandom in general. I mean, horror fandom, just fandom and what that was like. And I thought there could be this where Jigsaw has this indignation for people that he thinks don't understand how the world should work. The same thing can happen with, you know, maybe Sam. You know, and he could like misunderstand the people who made fun of horror and called a B movie and say elevated horror and all that stuff. And then where would he take it in this heightened world? And I saw a parallel to him and Jigsaw that I thought was really, really fun. And then taking that one step, one last step further. Well, now I get to do Saw style trap scare package style. And I'm like, now this sequel has legs you know, and and it'd be a lot of fun and, and making it more meta. So you're watching it with the actual characters, you know, all those types of things. It just really started to click around that. And we knew it was off and running, but none of that was intentional. You know what I mean? None of this was planned. <laughs> like it was just Shutter being like, hey, by the way, this is a hit. We should do a sequel. And I'm like, oh shit. Um, you know, and then and and we're off and running. Well, I'm glad uh, the first one was a hit because uh, what you've done with uh, Rad Chad's Revenge to bring everybody back was uh, really surprising. And uh, like you say, a, a lot of fun in in lampooning those tropes, I'll say. Um, yeah. And so in addition to Saul, though, I mean, we see Reanimator, we see Nightmare on Elm Street, we see uh, especially I love the Final Girls uh, segment in the mm-hmm. opening portion of the film. And so, um, you know, uh, well, how did you go about putting the the concepts for the uh, individual segments together? I mean, did you hear out pitches from individual filmmakers, or were some of the? I know uh, the uh, "We're All Dead" was you and and Cameron writing that one, mm-hmm. but I mean, the, the rest of them were those those filmmakers' ideas, or were those ideas that you pitched to these filmmakers? Uh, a combination of the two. Yeah, we we wrote We're So Dead and we found our, our filmmaker for that because I thought I had directed enough. I was like, oh, my God, what I'm directing is already too much in this. Um, so I don't want to do another one. But yeah, I mean, so with with uh, Welcome to the 90s, you know, that was Alexander Beretta. She's best friends with my producer partner, Ashley Sneed. And she made a short called Lady Hater that was just so funny. And it was just very sarcastic, just had this kind of like energy to it in the way the dialogue was. done. I was like, she's she's great. And then when I learned that she was a diehard horror fan, I went to her and I was like, look, I want to talk about something in your style of humor. I want something that's like a feminist, maybe final girl. Like, I think you could have a really, I always thought that there was an interesting commentary on the change of final girls and what was kind of going on. I didn't take it as literally as she did, but she took it further. We talked about that idea. And then she went off and wrote this brilliance. And it was actually, we, you know, we talked through a lot of filmmakers, we get pitches. This was one, the only one, I think that the first pitch we were like, yes, you nailed it. Let's just refine a few things. 
and off and running. And then we made that together. And um, it was it was just an honor to be on set with her and watching her work. She's so talented. And now I want to make a feature with her because she's she's so great. But yeah, I mean, you know, that and then, you know, Anthony Cousins, you know, he was the one that we brought back um, because he was already working in the sequel world. You know, he made a sequel in the first one. He's kind of already playing up the parody level of that. So in our sequel about sequels, I need to do a sequel to his movie that talked about sequels. Plus, I've never seen a sequel to a segment before. So that meant I had to do it. And we weren't saying, you know, one was better than the others from the first. It just, this one like really made sense, I felt like, to kind of continue a storyline. Um, and then Jed Shepard, you know, was someone we became friends like through the pandemic, like online, um, you know, just Twitter. And we were in Clubhouse conversations together. We did a couple panels together and just kind of became friendly. And actually, I had reached out to him to help me. I wanted to do a J-horror segment. Because again, 90s, 2000s horror boom was a big focus on this. And the 80s horror is going to permeate either way because it's just in my DNA and I can't get out of there. But we wanted to, you know, talk about some some new things. And, you know, it's, I was talking to Jed about J-horror and he had another director that um, he knew. So he's introducing me. But then like the timing didn't work for her and we couldn't kind of make it break down. And then I'm like, oh, man, I don't, I don't have so many. I really want to do this thing. And he's like, you know, I'm right here. And I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> You know, like, let's let's look at that. Um, and uh, then we started talking about ideas. And he's like, look, we can get the host girls together. And then once we settled on the three men and a baby thing, because I, I literally owned the laser disc of three men and a baby. And I took my friends came over and we put it on the biggest screen we could. And we would like, you know, frame by frame, watch it. And so that was something I did. So when I was kind of like, look, do that, like, take that and let that become the, you know, the the kind of like coming through the TV stuff, but from the three minute baby, have that be our J horror angle. And he goes and runs with it. So it's all different stuff, you know, like I'll have a little idea, a morsel of something, or they'll come back with something and we'll continue to tweak it. Like with Anthony Cousins and John Karska segment, we were on set for Old Man, uh, Lucky McKee's film. And, and Anthony was actually a uh, crew on that. And he would come up to me like in between takes and he's like, okay, so what if this and this and this? I'm like, ooh, what about this or this? And we would kind of like go back and forth with ideas. And then him and John would go write it. So yeah, I, I love that collaborative process with these other directors. Like it's just, I love producing, you know, it's something that's re I'm really passionate about. So Scare Package is that perfect amalgamation of all these things. I get to work with these talented filmmakers. I get to develop these stories. So I get to produce. And then I also get these like wild ideas that I get to foster and, you know, see become, you know, this absurdity that it is in the same, in the same uh, uh, bite. And it's, it's really special. Well, and I love that you then get to help uh, launch a lot of these filmmakers towards their feature lengths if they haven't already. I mean, Noah, we saw earlier this year with uh, Blood Relatives, which uh, I got to say, by the way, between this uh, old man and Blood Relatives, you're on a roll. Uh, you oh, thank you. And Paper Street this year. Uh, and so, I mean, you know, I, I love how you've done that with Scare Package. And is that something that you in particularly look for when you're building these rosters as those who maybe haven't gotten the time to shine just yet behind the camera? 100%. Yeah, no, astute observation, because there are a lot of People are like, oh, and people have suggested, and even 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 some very well known filmmakers have said, I want to do one, and I'm like, look, I know this sounds crazy that I'm saying no to you, but I really think there needs to be a little bit of a DIY aspect to Scare Package and what's there to the point where I mean, I'm definitely the most experienced at this point doing most of the Scare Package things, other than I would say Emily Higgins, the first one, um, but she was also in this like weird state where she couldn't get her next movie going and she was trying to figure things out. And I was like, well, then let's bring you in and do this. And then actually now we foster that same thing. Now we just did Sorry About the Demon, which by the way, will come out next month. Um, and that will be a whole other press cycle. And I think you'll I think you'll really dig it. But that movie came from, and it stars uh, John Michael Simpson from the first Scare Package opening. Like he's the star of it. So that, you know, also came from these opportunities. So I think it's, I definitely want, like I said, there's a DIY aspect that I think is important. And it's giving people opportunities because, nobody's really going to make a lot of money off Scare Package. Like we're, we're, I mean, any more money we get, we just put back onto the screen, you know, and because it's just, 
it's it, it really is a love letter. It sounds so cheesy to say, but it just really is these movies that we care about. And and these people are we're all kind of all in because we know that it's going to help everyone kind of like move their careers forward, hopefully. You know, so I love the idea. It is great breeding grounds for us, like testing grounds of like, okay, how's this filmmaker working with us? Is there something we could do? You know, and I mean, we have we have multiple features in development with scare package directors that's not even announced yet, you know. So I would love to continue doing that and kind of build out this roster of people and and be like, look, they did this and I can show them this segment and it's in a feature that people have seen and heard of. And it's not just a short film, even though it is a short film, you know what I mean? Like, it kind of gives them a little more kind of gravitas. And uh, that makes me really proud because now that we have become this company that can make a lot of movies, I want to use that privilege and help other people uh, to kind of get there. But yeah, I, there are still, there's a couple of filmmakers like, oh man, I can't believe I, I didn't say yes to that, <laughs> you know? Um, but but I think, again, it's what it's what makes sense for this type of movie that we're trying to do. So with that said, then with those those more prolific filmmakers uh, that you that are coming to you for this, do you have any ideas about maybe doing a separate anthology from the Scare Package series to maybe get those group of people together? Are you referring to Scare Package colon All Stars Grant? Because <laughs> we we have talked about it, Scare Package All Stars. Yeah, I mean, like we have. There was a day actually on set of the Pale Door, and we had all these storms and stuff, and so we had a lot of downtime. And I would get depressed because I'm like, I can't shoot right now in this movie, and everything's getting ruined. And the way that I felt better about it was I would go back to Scare Package and we would talk about all the Scare Package sequels we wanted to make and ideas. So, yeah, I mean, I want to have one that's all, uh, you know, queer directors and it's Scare Package out for delivery. You know, I want to do I mean, there's just like all these fun ideas that we have that I just think would be great. So, yes, I think in that universe there's so much that we could explore um and you know but 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 we'll see i, I mean hopefully enough people you know dig the second one to give us opportunities because again i'm still right now i'm in that phase where i'm like i don't know i don't know what are people going to think and uh but you know fingers crossed because we did we did try to give this a little bit of like a back to the future 2 kind of ending you know um so i'm hoping that kind of alludes to something um so you know and and hoping that there's opportunities there to continue continue this world yeah well from what i've been seeing on uh twitter especially people seem to be uh, the, the the horror genre community seem to be really digging it uh again so hopefully the, the yeah. rest of Everybody else uh, comes to it. And so with the DIY nature of this, I mean, the obviously the first one was very practical effects heavy as well. And uh, there was quite a lot of blood spilled, but this one certainly feels like it ump ups the ante. And so, I mean, was there any one uh, effect that you were really excited to get to bring to life in this one? God, I mean, there's a couple, you know, like, well, we also did. There, there's some there's some deliberate kind of shoddy CGI in moments because and I don't know if people always kind of get this, but like like ghost ship and stuff like that, that had these like in the 90s and 2000s, there was this weird mix where people hadn't fully figured out CGI but they were still doing practical effects. So I did sprinkle in a couple things. And it's funny, some people were like, this is just horrible CGI. I'm like, well, yeah, but that's of the era. Like that's how it's supposed to look. I remember even telling some of my VFX artists, I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to polish it anymore. I like it like this, that feels, that feels authentic to me. Um, but anyway, as far as the actual practical gags, God, I, I, look, I, I love that we got to skin my buddy Graham Skipper alive and keep him a character. Uh, throughout, which I thought was a lot of fun. Um, but probably my favorite gag, God, Moira's death is pretty good, where her head explodes, uh, was probably the the Dream Warriors thing with Sam, because it was both a ton of practical effects of kind of making him here, and he's wearing this these things with like syringe fingers and like references with them, references, references. But then we also built this TV. And then we had to do this leather kind of thing, this like that he could really break his head through. You know, and you and we couldn't do it multiple times, really. And you know, and 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 it's the behind the scenes. We're gonna have bloopers on the the uh, the physical media because like his stuff's all falling off, and it's like melting. It's like hundred degrees. And it's like falling. And if you even watch in the movie, you can see his glasses start to fogging, and it starts. And I'm like, this kind of makes it even more funny to me because it's so clearly like we're just like running out of time, and we couldn't even that whole sequence. 
Sam and the TV is never in the room at the same time all the actors are in the room because we couldn't we couldn't do it. They're just where the logistics were so difficult because it took so long to make that happen. I couldn't have them waiting around and I needed to be shooting other stuff because, again, it's so indie and we're so run and gun on this. So when Sam's in there talking, that's me running around just and I'm standing in each spot, giving him eye lines and just like talking shit back to him, you know, and giving him because Byron Brown plays him is just the funniest, literally the funniest person I've ever met. And he just makes me laugh all the time. So I'm just arguing with him, like in these perspectives. And he just kept going. Then I came back and then we're shooting this. I'm like, wait, what are we saying? I'm like, well, I said this. So I kind of need you to say it now, (laughs) you know, back to Sam and like Rich Summers, like, okay, all right, whatever, man, (laughs) you know, uh, we're figuring it out. It was so fun. And everybody was just so gung ho. And, but when the making that all come together was really special. So that one, because again, it just was, you know, it's blue screen here and it's this, it's just a mix of so many elements together to make that one act work, you know, that everybody kept telling me to cut the whole time in prep. Like, you need to cut this, you need to cut this. I'm like, no, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. I don't care. I'll figure it out. You know, and we did. So I'm proud of it. Well, I'm glad you figured it out because uh, the 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 second that the uh, on the TV they say it's prime time, bitch. I'm like, I know what's about to happen. <laughs> that's what I'm hoping to, yeah. And getting the individual to say that that said that was also a lot of fun, um, you know. Because I, I some, some people were like, oh, did you like? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I really, we really filmed him saying that, and then you know did that. So um, that was that was really really cool. And uh, seeing his outtakes of saying that. <laughs> is also really really funny um but yeah no yeah I, I, that's what i want i think the diehard horror fan is like shit it's happening you know and that's 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 what gets really gets me excited yeah so with all of these horror movies that um you're 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 referencing and homaging i mean if you could get your hands on any one of them is there one that you would love to to bring your vision to uh for an actual feature length film not not uh s- satire but straight up like if you were actually yeah. delivering a chapter of one of the, these franchises yeah 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 oh god yes um i mean well i will say we actually haven't we haven't really touched on this yet in it i i wanted there to be a reference to it but critters is a movie that I really want to do a Critters kind of reboot. Um, I actually pitched on it a few years ago and then they they canceled it. Um, so there is, I have a really crazy idea. I think it's, and again, but it's it's action horror. Um, it's more straightforward, you know, because I don't want to do all horror comedy. I mean, I love doing horror comedy, but, you know, The Pale Door and stuff. And I have another movie that I'm doing that's, that's not um, horror comedy. So yeah, there's that. But the, I mean, the Holy Grail to me, uh, you know, would be Friday the 13th. Um, and, you know, so that is uh, the franchise that probably most early got me into horror. It's the one that, you know, I mean, I am I do lists of my favorite kills and everything. It's just so, it's, you know, so that that would be something that I would love to explore. But, but I mean, all of these, just contributing to any of these franchises, I think would be special because they obviously have a lot of, I have a lot of reverence for them and, and what's there. And, and that's, that's what I do really hope with this movie, you know, as I hope that, you know, folks like yourself, if you watch this with someone else, it's maybe not as diehard of a horror fan as you are. And they see you laughing and they're like, what do you like? That's funny. Like, and you're like, no, 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 no. That's a reference to this. And it's like, if in hellbound, this happens and they're like, what's hellbound. And the next thing you know, you guys are watching hellbound. Well, now I've just recreated me 17 year old me in the video store, you know, being like, you got to go watch hellbound, you know? So, so that, is kind of the hope, you know, that it actually becomes the opposite. And that's why there's that line later. And I talk about the fandom of this. There's a line later that's like, there's no gatekeeping here. I really want this to be gateway. And I think even though it's for horror fans and the diehard horror fans are going to love it the most, my hope is that it, it, it evangelizes other horror to people who aren't. And it can be a little bit of both. I mean, that's like kind of the epiphany, if you will, that this could hopefully reach. But who knows? We'll see if anybody cares enough to do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I love about this film uh, and the first one as well is that it's it's not it's not like scary movie where it's taking a stab at these horror movies. It's it's showing reverence to them while also kind of homaging them. So that I I I hope uh, non horror genre fans get the same experience um, as as horror genre fans do. Um, yeah. And so uh, I love that there are also a lot of callbacks uh, to the first one. I mean, there's even uh, a Night at the Woods uh, style 
melting person at one point. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And so uh, what were what was you say was your favorite uh, callback to include uh, in this one? I mean, honestly, that, you know, getting the fact that we were able to kind of find a way to bring Goo Guy back in some way, you know, and Kirk is so funny. And what Chris McEnroy did there is so special. I and mean, he's even wearing the Fright Rags t-shirt from the night, you know, one, one time in the woods, he's wearing that again, you know, so finding a way that like, how do you, cause, cause again, we're trying to stay within our universe as crazy as it is. What is a movie is a movie and what is not, is it, you know, so how do you balance that? So that was something that, okay, well, he's in a movie, so he has to be an actor now. And then how can we still get a goo guy out of this? That was like a fun challenge to like reverse engineer and come up with a way to do it, which was really, really fun. And it wasn't originally that. In fact, originally two people at the funeral were Adam Green and Joe Lynch. And they were going to be there and then they were going to vomit on each other and kill each other. And, and we couldn't get the timing for them to show up. And then I rewrote it to do the Kirk thing. And I'm glad that I did because it, it kind of, you know, again, those restrictions Uh, breed creativity but yeah i mean there's also a few other like little and what anthony did you know and then he came back again there's a few very specific references um that are there and just like even when the 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 pseudo killer is like crazy night that's one of my favorite lines from the first movie um so yeah i mean there's 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 stuff uh in how it kind of plays um i do i do love seeing well that's a big spoiler so i won't say that um but uh but there's some things at the end that I think are really fun in particular um, and what's there. And then also um, the devil's like impaler, you know, finding a way to kind of like, you know, how he can show up, which again, that's the most logical to show up because he's a killer that can't be killed. So of course, you know, you can blow up in a car, but he can come back uh, just burnt looking. So um, yeah, I mean, that, that's, we, we had to be careful to find like too many things because you don't want it to feel like you have to watch the first one. Um, but, but I think if you do watch the first one right before, I think it'll be even more fun. And I think some of the jokes will land even a little harder. Well, I know I'm certainly looking forward to uh, having some double features for myself, if not with uh, friends, because uh, as I've said throughout this call, I mean, I love this. I love this franchise. This, this movie uh-huh. rules. The first one rules uh, you and your team always do a wonderful job with them. So, uh, Aaron, that is all the questions I really had, man. So thank you so much for taking the time 